Hi, I'm Donald Cole. I'm an Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Community Medicine at the Dalalana School of Public Health. And I also direct the Collaborative Doctoral Program in Global Health. So I really started learning about eco-health, ecosystems and human health when I got a postdoctoral fellowship in, um, with money from three granting councils, Natural Sciences and Engineering, Social Sciences and Humanities, and the Medical Research Council at that time. And that's really important to keep in mind because eco-health or ecosystems and human health draw on all those disciplines and so you can deal with health from any one of those perspectives. The projects I started working on were with people who ate lots of fish from contaminated hot spots in the Great Lakes, places called areas of concern. And those are between the United States and Canada in the Great Lakes. And they'd eat big carp that were loaded down with contaminants from Hamilton Harbor, or they'd eat um, pickerel that were filled with um, various kinds of organochlorines and metals and uh, um, chemicals like that. And so we in Health Canada and a number of stakeholders were really concerned about what that might mean for their health. But at the same time we recognized that they loved fishing, they loved being outdoors in the environment, that that was really important um, time for them. They shared their fish with uh, other people, uh, their friends, their family, old people who could not get out. And they, um, they also often benefit nutritionally from that uh, so that they could get protein and uh, great amino omega-3 fatty acids and things like that. So I learned this intimate relationship between ecosystems and human health and nutrition through that project. I also read a lot, and lots of people have talked about this, sometimes in very spiritual terms, or very philosophical terms, but also in very empirical ways about the pathways of bioconcentration of metals um, up into fish and then into human beings. So I took some of that understanding when colleagues in Ecuador asked me to come and help looking at the use of pesticides in small-scale potato production in northern Ecuador. And there, there was a time where people used to grow potatoes um, for centuries without any kinds of inputs other than those from the local environment. But then gradually in the 1950s, they started using pesticides, they started using more fertilizers, and initially productivity increased greatly. They earned lots of money. They were able to buy things from the city. They were, uh, their kids were able to eat better, go to school, all kinds of things, good, good things happened during the 60s and 70s. But at the same time, they were cutting down some of the forests, wildlife was dying, streams were becoming contaminated, they lost their animals sometimes because of the contamination. And what we showed was that they were also getting poisoned, their nervous systems were getting poisoned. So they, they were less able to think clearly, coordinate their hands um, and eyes, uh, remember, um, and these were related to their use of particularly organophosphate and carbamate pesticides. So we worked with them as a group of agriculture people, feminists, community health people, um, adult education people. Uh, in the interventions, things we called farmer field schools, but also we worked in schools with kids and the teachers to talk about the relationship between human health and agroecosystems and the ways in which uh, the way they were carrying out potato production at in the current model actually affected their health and particularly their children's health. Um, and so that work was, was uh, an example of work where I learned even more 
And I learned it along with colleagues from the International Development Research Centre in Ottawa, uh, a Canadian group that has put forth this idea of eco-health um, and really helped uh, a lot of researchers and practitioners uh, who are concerned about um, ecosystems and human health to uh, put into practice ways of improving health by changing ecosystems. Uh, that same kind of thinking um, we've tried to share with students. So, um, for instance, um, IDRC helped fund me and a colleague from South Africa to go across campuses across Canada to talk with students in classes as well as in public events about this relationship and how we can, how in, in the way we manage um, ecosystems, what we do with them, what we do to ourselves, uh, we can affect human health in positive ways, not just negative ways. The other thing we did was in our projects, in, in many projects where you're doing some research, you're also trying to change things. And so the eco-health idea is that you do it in a participatory way with stakeholders and affected communities. And everybody learns together and you put in practice ways of improving conditions right away and then you measure health improvement. So we could measure that farmers and farm families, their um, brain health if you like or the health of their nervous systems improved as we worked with them on reducing pesticide use. We then started to share that with students from universities, particularly in Ecuador, but we've also done it through a Canadian um, community of practice in ecosystem health with students from Canadian universities, mostly at the graduate level, um, but there are some senior undergrads uh, here in Canada. In Ecuador, they were all undergraduates in law and nutrition, in agriculture, in um, health education. And they came into the project and worked together with people who were running NGOs or people with the Ministry of Health or people with the Ministry of Agriculture and the farm communities and learned about the ways that uh, ecosystems and the ways of managing them and changing them um, can both be detrimental or can be positive for human health. So for me, that's the message for students is that a lot of the students said, we didn't know anything about this and we didn't know about the relay way the sectors were all related and the way we could work in, in one part of the ecosystem and improve health, even if we weren't a human health practitioner or a clinician, a nurse or a doctor. In some ways, even better if we weren't a doctor or a nurse because those people tended to be in the clinics. The, the other thing that we have tried to do increasingly though to, that speaks to your theme as a student group of integration with health services, we've tried to, and, and, and a, one of the leaders in this is a guy called Don de Sevigny with the World Health Organization and um, the Swiss Tropical Institute who worked in eco-health and is now working in health system strengthening and thinking about it from a systems perspective. So we see ways that those two have come to come together, systems thinking in both of those places. So one of the projects we do is working with families of pregnant women in Western Kenya to increase their attendance at antenatal care clinics, but at the same time provide them vouchers to grow orange flesh sweet potato, to increase the intake of vitamin A among themselves and their families, which will improve their ability to resist infection and at the same time improving the coverage of the health service so that more of them are getting adequate testing, adequate um, counseling uh, that they need to have healthy babies. So that's probably where I'm heading these days uh, in, my, in my work with colleagues around ecosystems, health services and human health.